He's described by some as Britain's most outspoken atheist. He's certainly an eminent scientist. He believes that religion fuels war, can ferment bigotry, and even, in some cases, abuses children. His latest book, The God Delusion, I have it here, is a rebuttal of religion of all types. And judging by the response from you, the viewers, who have been emailing us all afternoon, um, his ability to provoke controversy is undiminished. He is Professor Richard Dawkins of Oxford University. Richard, a very good afternoon to you. How do you do? Thank you for coming in. Thank you. What prompted this volume? I wanted to write a book like this for a while. My American agent about six years ago said, don't even think about it, you will never sell that in America. Things have changed. Uh, six years of Bush, and I think America is ready for an attack on religion. Britain? Britain always has been, and um, uh, I'm just sorry I didn't write it before. Um, in writing the book, what did you want it to achieve? Well, I do want to change people's minds. Anybody who writes a book, I suppose, wants that. I'm not optimistic enough to think that I'm going to change the minds of, of really deeply religious people. But I think there's a large middle ground of people who sort of think of themselves as vaguely religious. They go to church once a year or something, and they've never given it much thought. I want them to give it much thought. And I think that when they do, they will conclude that actually the religion of their upbringing is probably nonsense. You want people to go through an active decision-making process where they arrive at a conclusion which says, enough of this nonsense, I'm moving on. Yes. I know that's difficult. What would that achieve? Well, I think it would achieve a much less cockeyed view of the universe. I think people would be able to look out through open eyes at the world, at the universe, at humanity, and see a more realistic picture of the, of the way it is. Well, now, lots of emails from viewers, and um, I know you'll be happy to just take a few of them because they raise some specific points. So, Mohammed uh, from South London writes in and says, you believe that our world and our species all come from nothing but a bang by accident without design or organization. Don't you think this is completely ludicrous given the complexity of the world and of our bodies? It's like saying that I plant a bomb in a field and after it explodes the dust clears and there's a building standing there with elevators, lighting, meeting rooms and a reception. Well, what is course, the logic in that? <laughs> of course it's not like that and that's, not, that's nothing like what I believe. Um, any modern scientist would not believe in that. It doesn't come about by chance. It comes about in the case of the living world, which is the most striking of them. It comes about by Darwinian evolution by natural selection, which is poles away from chance. I'm afraid that the gentleman who e emailed simply needs to go and read a book about evolution. Um, another one here from Kulvinda in Tunbridge Wells. Uh, Professor Dawkins, um, I understand your horror at what human beings do to one another, but isn't it a bit simplistic, your approach? Indoctrination and willingness to kill can also come in the form of nationalism and political ideology. It, why pick on religion, he well, says? Well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you look at, at Stalin, for example, if you, if you look at many of the worst tyrants in the 20th century, um, they have had ideologies other than religious. They've been fanatics about whatever it is. In Hitler's case, a kind of crackpot racism. In Stalin's case, a crackpot Marxism. There are all sorts of other reasons than religion. But religion's a pretty good one, because religion means faith, and faith means believing something without evidence. And if you believe something without evidence, and you've been brought up to think that belief without evidence is somehow supremely virtuous, and you don't have to justify your belief, you just say, that's my faith, don't question it. That's a recipe for danger. Extending that logic, Philip from North Wales says, um, if you like this kind of set of values removed from religious structures, wouldn't a country like North Korea be your ideal kind of country? And very far from it, because North Korea has a most hideous ideology. It may not be recognizably a religious ideology, but it's just as fanatical, just as fundamentalist in the sense that it's based upon um, some kind of a book, some kind of a, a, re a recipe which does not require evidence. It doesn't require, indeed, argument is positively forbidden. Um, another one here about what you want to achieve. It's from, um, it's actually unnamed, I've got to admit that, but it's from a, a, somebody who calls himself Stop and Think. Um, <laughs> he says, what do you imagine you will achieve with these attacks on religion? People actually need a set of values decency and honesty and truth, he says, and um, yes. w how do well, you depart I mean, from that? D decency and honesty and truth come from philosophy, they come from law, they come from um, love of people, they come from the golden rule, do as you would be done by. There are all sorts of good sources for decency 
and truth. Uh, religion is actually not one of them. If you think about where we'd be if we followed the, mor the morals of the Bible, we would be, if a husband was discovered that his wife was not a virgin on their wedding night, he would have to stone her to death. Um, he would stone people to death if they break the Sabbath, if they worship graven images. We as a matter of, now of course, modern theologians have none of that. I'm not saying that they do, and that is indeed my entire point. We do not, none of us, take our morals from scripture. We take our morals from something else. To the extent that we take them from scripture, we cherry pick. We choose the nice verses from the Bible, we reject the nasty verses. The criterion by which we cherry pick is available to all of us, whether we are religious or not. If religion and faith, I know they're separate concepts, but can we just lump them together for a second? If religion and faith provide comfort, um, allow some people to live what they call a good life, um, allow them to have at least uh, an understanding of the world around them, even if, in your view, that understanding is a bit cockeyed, um, what's wrong with that? Well, comfort is a fine thing, and there are all sorts of sources of comfort, but because something is comforting, it doesn't make it true. And I care passionately about what's true. If somebody comes to me and says, I don't care what's true, I want comfort, then that's fine. They go away and get their comfort. But if somebody is genuinely interested in what's true, then I think they need to look to science. They need to look for evidence. A doctor can comfort you by saying you haven't got cancer when you have. Some people like that sort of comfort. Other people would rather hear the truth. One of the most provocative quotes is to do with abuse. Why do you lump the whole concept of religion in with abuse, certainly of children? Well, I'm not talking about sexual abuse no, no, now. No, I'm no. talking about mental abuse. Yeah. I do think that it's abusive to children to label them with the religion of their parents before they've had time to know what they really think. So what I would like is to raise people's consciousness the way the feminists raised our consciousness. So that whenever you hear a phrase like, that's a Catholic child, or that's a Protestant child, or that's a Muslim child, it should sound like fingernails on a blackboard. You should flinch when you hear that. That is not a Catholic child. That is a child of Catholic parents. Maybe one day it'll become a Catholic when it grows up old enough to make up its own mind. But for the moment, that is not a Catholic child. You should no more call it a Catholic child than you would call it a Marxist child, or a Keynesian child, or a monetarist child. Where do you draw the line for parents bringing up children? They can't just leave the whole thing to be a matter of chance, can they? They need guidance in some ways. They need to be given certain criteria by which to live their lives. Religion is just one way of providing children with these tram lines. Yes, well, I've already um, suggested that religion is not a very good way, and there are other ways. Moral philosophy, um, do to others what you would wish them to do to you. Try not to cause suffering, try not to cause hurt, uh, try to be good to everybody. These are all things which are, which come from many different religions and from no religion, that would be a fine way to bring children up morally. I think it is important that children should be educated about religion because it is a fact of life, but not just one religion, not just the religion that they are told you've got a label around your neck that says you are a Christian or you are a Muslim. Let them learn about other religions and none. And lot, then make them, let them make their own mind up. Sorry to interrupt. Lot, lots of the people who wrote in last week were very exercised by this story from Blackburn where Jack Straw, the uh, yes. former foreign secretary, had asked uh, women to consider taking off their veils, Muslim women, uh, when they came to his surgery. I'm, I'm intrigued, given your perspective on this. What do you thought of that? Jack Straw never said they must take off their no. veils. He simply invited them to consider taking off their veils, which is an entirely reasonable thing to do. And they could say no. Or they could say yes. His point was that humans, and this is an undeniable point, that humans use their face in communication. You can really see that. That's why it's better to go and see your MP rather than telephone him, because you can each see each other's face. It defeats the object if you cover up almost all of your face. But he never said you must take your veil off. He simply said consider it. But, but interesting that even in asking them merely to consider, it caused that prod, didn't it? Well, isn't now, that interesting? Now, what do you make of that? Well, <laughs> I mean, it seems to me to show an, 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 an almost ludicrous hyper-sensitivity. He didn't tell them to take their, their veils off. It's a kind of his, almost hysterical reaction to something that he didn't say. Now, there's one here which I, I want to put you because it's, um, it's slightly sort of fuzzed my brain, but I want you to deal with it because you've got a very big brain, okay, Professor Dawkins, <laughs> there we are. Um, now, it says, this is Steve West, who writes in from Portugal, by the way, and says... Professor Dawkins has lucidly demonstrated the logical inconsistencies of the existence of a deity. The question I'd like to ask is, why would an omnipotent deity be limited by the man-made invention of logic? 
Well, if he's suggesting that we can't use logic in order to, uh, uh, to bring our minds to bear upon the question of the existence of, of, of God, I find that a most incredible cop-out. I mean, it, it means, it, in a sense, anything goes. That way madness lies. Because you could use that argument to demonstrate the existence of fairies, the flying spaghetti monster, the orbiting teapot. I mean, there a, a million things, um, golden unicorns. There's no limit to the number of things that you could justify once you abandon logic. Professor Dawkins, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, and uh, it's certainly a controversial book, and I'm sure that people will enjoy the argument, but thank you very much for thank coming Thank you in. very much.